Hey, Mike, um, how are you? I'm pretty good, man. Yourself? Good. You want to introduce yourself? I, I will go first. My name is Michael Konzel. I'm a uh, research fellow with the Roosevelt Institute. I'm a blogger at New Deal 2.0 and the Rorty Bond blog, and I write a lot about financial issues and uh, financial reform. Excellent. And I, I hope you'll explain what Rorty Bomb is or what the <laughs> derivation is before I introduce myself, because I'm curious. Um, actually, it's it, it's an old blog that was actually just kind of a travel blog where I just wrote about, you know, uh, vacations I was taking and, you know, restaurants I'd eat at and stuff like that. And I ended up blogging about the financial crisis and it just took off from there. And, you know, here I am, but I never moved the name over. So it is actually an illusion of Richard Rorty. It's just an old Internet handle I used to use. I used to be more of a philosophy nerd than I am now. Gotcha. Gotcha. Oh, well, I'm Jesse Isinger. I'm a senior reporter at ProPublica, which is a nonprofit investigative news organization uh, started about two years ago. So good to make your acquaintance, finally. Um, yeah, and you, you have a long history. You wrote for the, the Wall Street Journal and you wrote for Portfolio and that was online. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of your writing and, and you have just written for ProPublica this, I think, one of the best pieces of the financial crisis, a story about a hedge fund named Magnetar. And, um, I, you know, do you want to talk about it for a little bit? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, so my colleague Jake Bernstein uh, uh, here at ProPublica and I put together a story on Magnetar. And we worked with Planet Money, NPR's Planet Money, and This American Life. It was an episode on This American Life uh, and and then a big story on our website, ProPublica.org. And what it is, it's about uh, the period of 2006-2007 where the structured finance market, the market of bundling mortgage securities, is actually looking like it might slow down in late 2005. And then all of a sudden in 06, it revives again. And it revives because banks figure out that they find a customer for the, the riskiest bottom slice of these mortgage securities, uh, bundled mortgage securities called collateralized debt obligations or CDOs. And the main big buyer of these risky small pieces at the bottom, the, the pieces that will suffer the first loss called the equity, uh, the main buyer is a hedge fund out of Chicago. No one's really ever heard of them. It's re they're a relatively new hedge fund. They're called Magnetar. So and let's back up a little bit. So it's two, it's 2005. And, and yeah. oh, you know, in retrospect, it was clear there was a housing bubble. But even then, people had a sense that something was going wrong with housing. You know, you would, um, uh, the, the, the late author, uh, David Foster Wallace, um, you can actually catch him. He, he wrote once in a random story about listening to the radio and all these radio ads would come on for, you know, refinance your mortgage, you know, yeah. buy, a new, buy a new house, buy a house of your dreams, you don't have to wait. And, you know, you were like, w where did these people come from? What were they doing three years ago? This is 2005. And, yeah. and I think a lot of people, especially in retrospect, see that, like, where did all this come from? And it was clear that, that, that it was bubbling up and then it seemed to have cooled. And um, why, why don't we talk a little bit about where the subprime was going into, uh, into this kind of CDO structure? It, that, yeah, that's very interesting point because uh, there was a lot of coverage of the uh, housing bubble. It was uh, the press was full of it. The Economist magazine had you know every other week it was a cover saying there was a housing bubble. In '05 on Wall Street, and I was covering this for uh, at the Wall Street Journal and writing about this. The uh, there's a big debate about the housing bubble. Some people are bulls, some people are bears, but uh, there's a lot of worry. And in sort of mid to late 2005, the subprime mortgage originators, the subprime companies like New Century, uh, if you remember that name, they uh, their stocks tank down 30 uh, percent because people start to see the bubble as uh, really dissipating, really uh, that th it's going to be over now. And there are a lot of other problems. There are problems in early uh, defaults. Um, delinquencies start to rise, uh, so subprime mortgage holders are not able to make their payments on time, and something really bad happens, but it's not clear to a lot of people, is that early payment defaults start happening. In other words, some mortgage uh, holders are defaulting in the first payment. They're not making the first payment. And when that happens, Wall Street banks can send the uh, mortgages back to the originators. And oh. the Wall Street banks uh, see this, and they worry about this, and they send them back. But And so that's why in late 05, there's this worry that this sort of the conveyor belt, the mortgage conveyor belt uh, on Wall Street is really coming to uh, slow down. 
So that, that, that's a great point because you see those statistics a lot. And I don't know if uh, viewers would know that there is a statistic that measures this, but there is a notable statistic that how many homeowners weren't making the first payment. So think about that if, if you buy a mortgage. Think if you buy anything. Yeah. You know, you go through a huge process. You sign documents. You, you know, hire a lawyer perhaps or, you know, you, it's, it's a pain to, to purchase something at that scale. And then you don't make the first payment. So, like, clearly something is broken. Like, you know, there's fraud that someone didn't understand what they were doing. Like, was there, do you get any, any sense from reporting about what goes on with those kinds of things? Because you always hear that number. I mean, you do. Uh, that That is the signal of fraud. And there was always this provision on for the Wall Street banks to be able to uh, put back these loans. And there were always one or two where often it would be uh, kind of a, just a mistake. The paperwork hadn't been in order, so it did. Uh, there was something uh, that didn't go out, some mailing that didn't go out, and that gets sort of rectified. But you clean the little mistakes up, and there's one or two of them in every uh, mortgage securitization. But here, what was happening in sort of mid to late '05 was that there were a lot of them, and that was really the signal to a lot of people that there was uh, a lot of mortgage origination fraud going on, predatory lending, big problems in the lending. Um, and, uh, you know, the numbers were still relatively small. We didn't have anything like the delinquencies that we uh, started to see much later. But uh, this was a was treated as an extremely important signal by a lot of bears on Wall Street, and the bears' numbers were growing. Right. So in, around 2005, it looked like the housing market might cool down. That um for a variety of reasons, including, you know, some obvious trigger mechanisms were, were kind of kicking in to realize that it had overheated and it was going to slow down. Then Magnetar comes in the scene. Yeah. And also, so, so when you have a, a, a CDO for, for our purposes here, you know, you have the, the people who hold all the debt. And then you have this extra group called the equity group. And they take on the most risk. And they're meant to... You know, if you're a bondholder, what you, you know, you're not really watching the stock market every day to see if you're up or down two percent. A, a lot of people, especially the way these bonds were, they were AAA rated. Um, they, what you want to, you know, put your money there and then forget about them. They, they're supposed to be as good as cash, which is what AAA means. You know, it's the equivalent of having money in your wallet. Um, so, what the last thing they want to do is, is worry about them. So they, they, so the CDO people, the people who created these mortgage bonds. They, they put a special group of people, we'll call, you know, the equity people is what they're called, and they're the ones who hold all the risk. Or, you know, they're, they're, they're the ones who are meant to hold all the risk. And when they were having trouble finding people to sit in this hot seat, suddenly this hedge fund in Chicago showed up and was more than willing to do it. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, exactly. You're exactly right. So in a sort of 04, 05 time frame, they can find uh, investors that would normally sort of be seeking equity-like returns with some fixed income-like protection. So it's a very risky slice, but uh, risky in terms of the sort of fixed income world. Um, but those those guys disappear, and uh, by early 2006, really there's a, only a, a collection of buyers, and they're almost all hedge funds. And Magnetar is the biggest by far. Uh, and so what Magnetar does is, by the spring of 2006, what they do is they go and approach investment banks and they ask them to create CDOs. Now, let, I'll just step back because I don't know if we've totally explained it, but what happens is mortgages get bundled into mortgage-backed securities hundreds to thousands of mortgages. They all get bundled into mortgage-backed securities, which get sliced up into tranches based on uh, their ratings, the, the risk and the return associated with each slice of these. And then, uh, in turn, those securities can get bundled up into these things called CDOs. So we're talking about these CDOs backed by mortgages. And this is the area that Magnetar is playing in. And so they go and they approach the investment bank and they say, we want to buy equity. We want to buy lots and lots of equity. We're, we're the buyer for it. And they uh, eventually, over the course of a year's time, they work with at least nine different investment banks. They uh, invest in 30 different CDOs, at least 30 different CDOs. We've confirmed the names. Jake and I have confirmed the names of 26 of them. And uh, they do an estimated $40 billion worth of deals, which we think is roughly accounting for about a third to a half 
of the subprime CDO market, this corner of the subprime CDO market that they're operating in. It's a, a huge amount, a huge uh, number of deals. Now, and there's a kicker here, which is they're not just buying the top, sorry, the bottom slice, the slice that gets the whole deal done, uh, but they're also shorting the middle of the deal. They're, right. so let's, they're let's, betting against there. it. Before we get there, um, yeah. so it's 2006, and, and you know, Magnetar shows up, and they say, we really want to start investing in vehicles for subprime mortgages. What do you think at the investment bank? So you know, the, the very first day that this happens, now we, we have a sense of what happens later on, and what, once they, they kind of curtains pulled back, but what are you thinking when you see Magnetar walk in the room and say, you know what, a lot of people say the housing market is a... Uh, Overheated, but we want to put more money in there. We want to facilitate more lending and help. Well, with that. we yeah, that's a great question. We we talked to one banker who said it seemed like a miracle. <laughs> These guys uh, were coming in; it was wonderful. And the other thing you're sort of thinking is these guys are suckers, right? Um, right. That these guys are going to uh, uh, get their hats handed to them. Now, um, but they're not suckers. They're very smart. So there's some puzzling out of what's going on over the course of, as the word sort of trickles out in the spring and summer of 06, as these guys are producing lots and lots of deals and putting the word out that they want to buy all this equity, there's a lot of um, talk about Magnetar on CDO desks trying to figure out, well, what are these guys up to? What, uh, you know, how are they going to make money? Are they really uh, buying all this stuff and just, are they such huge housing bulls? And as I say, there's this kicker here, which, and CDO desks figure this out pretty quickly and continue to work with Magnetar, but they eventually understand what Magnetar is doing, which is they are betting that the CDOs will collapse on the same, on the one hand, they're betting that the CDOs will collapse. On the other hand, they're putting a little bit of money in so that the deals can be created uh, by the investment banks. Because once Magnetar is there investing in this little slice at the very bottom, this enables the investment bank to have comfort where they go out and they can sell the rest of the structure the safer, supposedly safer parts of the structure to investors all over the world, and they, they fan out, and they do just that. Right. So um, the, the analogy, so this, this made for a great uh, This American Life episode, and um, the analogy they use is like the, the musical and the movie producers, right? So they're, Yeah, exactly. So, so, you know, it's you put up some money, and then if the thing collapses, you stand to make a lot of money. Um, exactly, which is, yeah. Which, which gives you a cynical attitude to to it. So to go a little bit further, um, now in theory there's safeguards. So I, I want to think about this kind of like why did the market fail here? Because you know you know we can talk about the details and this tranche and this tranche, but you know the, the financial markets should have stopped this. I mean this 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 almost is kind of you know a, a metaphysical problem. Like what what failed here for us as a system? And obviously the next line of defense is that you have the investment bankers who should be trying to diversify risk instead of amplifying risk. And you write about um, Magnetar was going out there and, and from what you report was putting pressure on people to make these things riskier than they normally would have been, which would have been fairly risky to begin with. And if I saw a number, something like 96% 90 of the Magnetar debt is worthless. Is this, is this like a kind of approximate number? Yes, 96 of the 96 uh, percent of the CDOs that they invest in that we identified mm -hmm. uh, had events of default. In other words, they're nearly worthless, uh, and that compares to a very high number of regular CDOs, but not as high. Something on the order of 65 uh, percent, if I recall correctly. Right. Um, uh, depends on how you uh, compare it to the rest of the, which market you're comparing to, something between the high 50s and low 60s. So most of the deals fail um, in general, but almost all of the Magnetar deals fail. Right, 96%, like, you can't get much higher. Like, you might even just have measurement error. You know, it's, it's, pretty good. it's a pretty good record, yeah. Right, right. Succeeded. Um, so, and, and so t tell me a little bit about the, the pressures that you were able to identify that Magnetar put on agents, be them yeah. um, the, the investment banks. Because you, you want to step back and say, you know, people bought homes and people bought mortgage debt and they made a bad call. But clearly there should have been some mechanism to stop this, some sort of, if 
given that we've deregulated so much of the financial marketplace, obviously we did that under the assumption that market participants would be able to do this, that the market, you know, through an invisible hand, is, is the analogy used, would have stopped, you know, predators from coming in here and, ra- you know, radically distorting our capital markets, you know. So yeah. who, who failed? And, I, uh, and I'll just add one thing to that before I uh, answer the, that question, but which is that uh, not only did that, those things fail in the market, but that the, they perverted the mechanism of the bears. So the bears come in, the short sellers, the people who are skeptical, the sort of the free market answer to regulation is short selling and uh, bearish investors expressing their view. And in this case, bears... Uh, express their view by creating new products to uh, be sold to other people that wouldn't necessarily have existed otherwise, and then betting against them, exacerbating the losses and the crisis. So it totally subverted what normally should happen from bearish views and bearish investors. Anyway, the, the people who failed, it seems to us, uh, it seems to us that Magnetar has done absolutely nothing illegal. Um, and that the investment banks uh, were the ones that went out and sold this, and there was no disclosure anywhere about Magnetar's involvement in the deals, that they bought the equity, that they had sponsored the deals, and that they had bet against the deals. And then the CDOs had these third-party, supposedly independent money managers. We've heard a lot about this in the Goldman Abacus SEC case, but there was a third party that was supposed to be managing all the all the Magnetar deals. And they were had a fiduciary duty to the investment itself, the CDO, to make sure that it was fairly represented to all the investors. And the CDO managers, in our cases, we believe, uh, almost all of them, understood that Magnetar was shorting. They certainly knew that Magnetar was uh, had a lot of influence over the deal and pushed them. We have seven cases where they pushed for riskier stuff to be put into the CDOs, at, you know, demanding it, asking for um, for riskier stuff. And uh, and, and remember, and, at this point, I'm going to cut in on you a few times. Yeah. Um, like the, the magic of these things were that they were meant to diversify risk, right? Like they 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 were meant to, you know, you could, you know, Oregon might have a housing bubble and Florida might have a housing bubble. Well, they never have one at the same time. And what you actually see is that th- what people are doing are using these to amplify risk, is what you just described. That they're that they're kind of doubling down on these things without the, without the people at the end user knowing what is actually happening with it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, not to skip ahead to the story, but also concentrating the risk because it go- it concentrates it in the banking system because ironically the bankers uh, are working for institutions that actually buy these things and get or get stuck with them and uh, delude themselves into thinking that the the senior portions are so safe that they uh, won't ever take losses and so. When the financial crisis hits and these these things go down, the losers turn out to be the banks that many of the banks that actually uh, design these products for Magnetar, and of course the ultimate losers. That means uh, were you and me and the rest of the taxpayers around the world and American taxpayers especially. Mm-hmm. So. So it's, it, it, it's just a crazy story to me because it's it's one of those things where you kind of sit back and, and, you know, the first instinct when we were kind of, everyone's coming up with a narrative of what went wrong with the financial sectors, everyone looked at, you know, community organizers or, you know, Fannie and Freddie. Yeah. Uh, you know, people saying, you know, obviously homeowners were taking out loans they couldn't afford. And, you know, people would say, but it, these loans were being pushed on them. And it, it feels like a weird argument because, like, well, why would someone push a loan on someone that, they can't afford, like something not right there in that story. But then, you, you know, you, you keep investigating. You're like, well, you know, there's six guys in a suburb of Chicago, you know, running a hedge fund from their living room or wherever. And, you know, they're making this market keep going, even when, when it doesn't want to, even when, when there's no rationality for it. Totally. And, uh, you know, there's one of the big uh, explanations for the 
uh, you know, for the crisis is that everyone lost their heads. We all got a little greedy. Uh, homeowners got just as greedy as Wall Street bankers. Um, and and I feel like that has been a complete misinterpretation of the, uh, the housing bubble and the financial crisis. And one of the things that this story should uh, help people understand is that it it moved in reverse. If uh, if Wall Street could sell the little piece at the bottom of the riskiest deal at the end of the assembly line, that enabled them to build the CDO, which enabled them to build the mortgage-backed securities, which enabled uh, mortgage companies to sell them to Wall Street, which enabled them to go out and make more loans. So it all comes from Wall Street going backward to homeowners, not homeowners demanding loans from banks. And intuitively, actually, if you think about it, it makes sense because I can't walk into a bank and tell them to give me a loan that I can't afford. Uh, it only happens if the bank right. offers me a loan I can't afford. And, and, that, and, that's, and that's crucial because it's, it's a lot of the narrative. So, so you have kind of two narratives. One is how, you know, markets work in general. And, and you know, obviously we've deregulate a lot of the financial industry on the assumption that these things would take care of themselves, that innovation and reputational effects and just the price mechanism itself would make regulators superfluous at best, but also, you know, possibly very dangerous. And, and you actually watch this kind of deregulated space, and you see that you know, it, the moment when a bubble starts, the market can actually find it very profitable instead of correcting it, which is what it's supposed to, to push it further away, to really drive in more money into places it shouldn't be. Yeah. This, this is a major failure. The, the, the last decade, you know, we built trillions of dollars of just worthless assets. And, and you know, it created a housing product that people will not want in 10 years that's rapidly depreciating in the middle of a massive national foreclosure crisis. And... You know, the Keynesians are, were popular in, in the mid-century because they kind of stepped into the Great Depression. They had a story of what was going on. And, you know, the Friedmanites and the Chicago people were popular because they stepped into the stagflation in the 70s and had a story for what's going on. And I, I don't know what story steps in here. And, it's it, you know, I, I'm, you know I, I'm someone who wants markets to work. And, it's you know, you kind of watch this actually play out, and you realize it's not like an ideal gas or, you know, money just doesn't naturally go where it's supposed to, that there are people who are very self-interested sitting at crucial nexuses in, in, inside the system and yeah. able to able to just, you know, radically, you know, d destabilize what, what needs to be done in, in a system like this of lending. So... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I, I, it's, uh, it has been a question of mine what, what is going to step in here uh, ideologically and uh, what is going to step in here intellectually for, you know, this is beyond my area of expertise, but I've been really interested in seeing economists struggle with this. And you see the Chicago School, you've seen a lot of coverage of the Chicago School and, they, and uh, retrenching and defending their uh, ethos to the hilt and completely denying uh, what's going on here. I mean, the specifics of the Magnetar trade show us that uh, individual bankers had incentives that not only were selfish, uh, but also could you know incentivize them to do things that were bad for the institutions themselves. Now, so not just bad for society, which would be um, bad enough, but bad for the institutions, uh, which led to the institutions collapse. So uh, that's a big problem, and I I don't know how you change Wall Street culture like that. I mean, uh, you, we've sort of grown accustomed to. Wall Street bankers being selfish and rapacious and uh, even elevated that to those qualities to being admirable in some spheres. And uh, and we need a cultural shift, but I, I, I don't see any uh, evidence that that's particularly happening. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's, it goes back to, like, it shows that when, when people think about markets working perfectly, it's really predicated on some things like everyone has really good information. And you can see it in the story. I mean, it's, it's right there in the Magnetar story and the uh, NPR story, or the, uh, the, the American Life story. It's like, clearly some people do not understand what's going on. And and the, the information becomes more concentrated among people who are the most cynical at exploiting that. It's, it, it's oh, just, yeah. And, it, you know, it's, 
uh, you know, and then the bonuses come in, and everyone has every incentive to just push the losses to someone else. As you brought up the the inner inner firm agency problems. So, yeah, yeah, I mean the the you know just to be clear to the listeners, you know this. So what these were were credit uh, CDOs which didn't uh, have any regulation, and the pricing mechanisms are totally opaque to uh, even to many of the investors in the um, in the CDOs because the Wall Street desks tightly control them and often you're dealing with a unique relatively unique instrument so really it's just one desk that controls the pricing of it and it's not even clear to you what that price should be and then we've got this whole other area of credit default swaps which are insurance like derivatives that were totally unregulated um, and uh, and the pricing mechanisms of those are uh, opaque even to the buyers and sellers of them uh, and often get concentrated in the hands of a few dealers. So so you've got uh, all sorts of information asymmetries here. Yeah, and it's, you, you went back a little bit to the culture of Wall Street. We should probably start talking a little bit about regulation, but in some ways, like, the regulation battle is, is depressing because you can see it being not at all about the culture of Wall Street. And you know, one thing, I, I don't know, um, a lot of our viewers probably aren't, don't interact a lot with Wall Street, but one thing that might surprise them is movies like um, the movie Wall Street, the Oliver Stone one with Michael Douglas and the Green yeah, sure. Speech. Uh, there's a book called Michael, uh, by Michael Lewis. Um, uh, what's, what's his 80s book? Um, Liar's one? Poker. Liar's Poker. Yeah. Um, they, they talk a lot about how people will come to them and say that that book or that movie inspired them to work on right. Wall Street. That's you, an amazing you ever thing. Seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That happens all the time, and that's that's scary, right? <laughs> that this was an inspiration, yeah, that this is a model of behavior. Uh, yeah, no, it's incredible that they use these cautionary, they viewed these cautionary tales in the exact wrong way. Um, there, there's, uh, there's a film absolutely. school theory that says you can never really make an anti-war movie because just depicting war is sort of beautiful and not. <laughs> this, this, this old school God. film critic from Chicago in the 70s, uh, I was talking to him, and he, I asked him what he thought about Full Metal Jacket, which is the, the Kubrick movie, which is pretty a pretty harrowing tale of what, what yeah. warfare does to people. And the guy walks out, and he's just like, you know, it's just going to make it's another movie. He uses some explicit. Uh, he says it's another movie that's going to make kids want to join the army. <laughs> and, uh, and and uh, I kind of feel that, like I kind of worry. I see Magnetar, and there's some level that says like, man, I would love to be the guy who did the Magnetar trade. I would I, make a lot of money for about two years of work, and I'd retire and. Like, you know, how how can we even critique the kind of rip-the-face-off mentality of, of what passes for the way the capital markets work without, like, just, you know, without having there be some sort of cultural change with it, too? Right. Uh, absolutely. And we wondered that, too. Will, uh, will investors look at this uh, story and think, my God, Magnetar is really uh, brilliant. We want to put our money there with them. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, one of the... the the really terrible things about Wall Street of the last uh, uh, five, ten years has been that it has attracted the great minds of our generation, uh, I think, or many of the great minds of our generation, physicists, biochemists, uh, mathematicians, computer scientists. They have all gravitated to Wall Street and to hedge funds. Uh, and you know, what they do is they trade paper uh, back and forth with each other mm -hmm. and try to rip each other's faces off. And, uh, you know, you'd really like society to push these guys into figuring out uh, drugs to uh, help us... Uh, you know, cure cancer or to help us with global warming, and I, and we need a shift away uh, from this sort of inter intellectual capital brain drain, uh, and uh, you know, or a brain magnet that Wall Street is, and where the the money is so alluring and so outsized and insane. I think a lot of people would say, well, you know, uh, it was a difference between making, uh, you know, five hundred thousand, three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars as a top doctor or scientists and making two million, I might, you know, I might stay with uh, the research because uh, I want to help people. But 50 million, 100 million, a billion dollars, it's its too alluring. Yeah, and, and it cascades down, too, because um, what's, what's, there's that story that was one thing. Um, there's a story in the New Yorker about two towns that were... Um, um, yeah, the Atul Gawande story about healthcare, right? Yeah, fantastic story. Yeah, and um, they talk they talk a little bit, and it's briefly alluded to about how doctors saw themselves as like kind of 
you know, ripped the face off businessmen. Like they like purposely, you know, were incentivized yeah. to, to do surgeries that weren't necessarily needed and et cetera. But they view themselves as wanting to make a lot more money. And that's what happens when, you know, they're, I have a, I have a good friend who's a doctor who almost went into consulting and I won't name what firm, but you know, was really strongly considering it. And it was, you know, kind of financialized consulting around healthcare and, you know, it probably would have ended up in, in, in a hedge fund uh, dealing with healthcare stocks. And, you know, they're, they're now a very happy doctor. But it's one of those things where it's the, the brain drain, I think, is really a crucial thing going into the 21st century. Because, as you point it's one thing if it's just trading paper. But the Magnetar story kind of puts us in a place where we're saying, what if it's actually far more destructive than just, like, digging holes and filling holes? You know, like, what if it's, like, you know, really distorting <laughs> things in a way that's profitable to few people? Absolutely, and I think that's what the financial crisis showed us, that it was uh, short-term profitable, and then we uh, socialized the losses. Uh, so I, I think it, it's beyond, uh, beyond argument at this point. But the problem is that 2009 roared back. Monster year, and I don't, uh, you know, I was just talking at lunch with a guy uh, this week who uh, does research on hedge funds uh, for institutional investors. He said hedge fund business is booming. It's back. Lots of startups. Uh, guys and you know, institutions, pension funds, endowments are giving lots and lots of money to hedge funds. Now, naively, here I was in late 08 thinking that the hedge fund boom was over. Uh, and thinking the private equity boom was over, just thought that this uh, it, these guys had been unmasked for being wildly overpaid for not producing any kind of value for their money. And uh, here it is one year later and, uh, you know, one and a half years later and everybody's uh, back to the races. I, I And it's sort of shocking to me. And, of course, all the Wall Street banks are making record profits 18 months after the crisis. Yeah, um, it, it's actually getting lost in the greater. It's actually, in some sense, it's perfectly timed, but in some sense, no one's covering it, is that everyone's giving their uh, earnings announcements right now. Uh, Gold yeah, Gold exactly. Announced. It was, was a big one with $4 billion. $4 billion in profits in this economy, in this 20% underemployment, and they made $4 billion. Right, and it's not lending. Uh, yeah. And it's not, it's not, it's not uh, lending at all. And or it's not uh, being an intermediary, intermediary standing between companies that want to raise money to sell products that people need and the customers that want to buy them. Uh, you know they're not doing any of that right now. So so the financial uh, so well that brings us to reform, right? <laughs> that brings us to reform. Uh, so we're recording this Friday afternoon. That's uh, what is it, the twenty third. So um, these things are changing hour by hour, and, and I'm kind of following them morning by morning because it's too much of a headache to follow hour yeah. by hour. But um, it's very likely um, that we'll have a financial reform bill within a week or two um, that will take it to a vote Monday, it sounds like. And because of the uh, SEC complaint, because of um, Goldman in general, and, and also just because of Wall Street in general, um, you know, very few Republicans are going to want to really fight them on this. And and also, more crucially, though, people only sometimes report this, is a lot of the new Democrats won't necessarily want to fight this either. So, uh, I am. Uh, tell me, you've been watching this more closely than I have, but uh, the this political tidal shift is absolutely stunning to me, and uh, and especially the Blanche Lincoln derivatives bill, or you know, derivatives part of the legislation that was just proposed in the Senate. Can you tell us a little bit about that and tell us how that came about? Because everybody I had talked to before she made her proposal had thought that she was going to come out with a very weak proposal, a weaker one than the House, which uh, had already been uh, had significant weaknesses. Absolutely. So um, uh, let's go back a little bit. Last June, um, uh, Obama's Treasury Department put out its white paper on financial reform, which kind of laid out what they wanted uh, the financial reform uh, bill to look like. Uh, it went to the House and passed in December. Um, there was a couple things that were missing right out the door in the House. Um, there was bans on abusive swaps. There were position limits. Um, there were a couple things with how to define who is a major swap participant? That were more that were just missing in the initial version. Yeah. Okay, Mike, can you explain abusive swaps? Because I think this is a very interesting uh, issue, and I'd like to understand it more. And also, this would go directly potentially to the Magnetar trade. 
Absolutely. So the big thing when you talk to people about what – I have the same question, like a piece of swaps, really, what's that about? And um, the big thing is, is purposely trying to drive a company into bankruptcy um, yeah. when, when there is an option to not do that. So this is something that started to happen about 10 years ago um, with minor things, and it's it's now becoming more of an issue. And I think we will um, continue to have CDS as a major part of our capital markets going forward. So I think it's going to continue to be an issue. Is what do you do when you know you know debtors in a business when, when people want to avoid bankruptcy, when people want to work it out, but someone who is not a party to that transaction um, can profit from from forcing a company into default. Um, that's one of the situations where people freak out about, and they want the CFTC to have some negotiating room. So that the CFTC could, uh, well, in in fact, what it is is they, um, it's that they own bonds, so they have some influence over what the uh, the company's future is going to be. But they actually have this undisclosed credit default swap position where they would profit more from the bankruptcy uh, and putting those CDSs into default uh, and having them triggered. Uh, and so they actually get to wield their influence while having this ulterior motive. I think that's what, you know, uh, Gary Gensler was talking about recently in a speech. Uh, you know, I think it's the empty creditor problem, right? Yeah. And, and you don't even have to have an underlying stake, right? Like if you just happen to have a, a naked CDS on a firm that's about to go bankrupt, you know, what are your negotiating privileges under when, you know, everyone sits down at the table. And you know, there's a big thing with, um, I'm going to blank on it, but with a, a trucking union. Uh, well, uh, yellow. Trucking yeah. 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 Uh, well, did, December, uh, uh, but uh, um, how does, uh, how do you sit down at the table if you don't have the stake? If you're naked uh, swap uh, holder, how would you uh, affect any influence? Is that really the case? Well, um, I mean, that's a good question. So, like, do you then go and buy bonds, and then you're, you're then at the table? But um, I'm going to just kind of skip over that. So there, I want to talk about the yeah. end user exemption. Because we're, we're pushing okay, that. it's good. But I wanted to bring that up because, uh, mm-hmm. in fact, this whole issue of the Magnetar story points to the idea that it's wrong-headed to only talk about credit default swap protection in the case of empty, I mean, sorry, naked creditors, this idea that you can buy insurance on your neighbor's house and then you have an incentive to burn it down. What happened with the Magnetar story is they, by dint of their purchase, they have influence over the structure and they can push for a riskier structure that they end up taking a credit default swap on. And so my concern, which has been, uh, it seems neglected in the legislation, uh, is that you have these empty credit or empty ownership positions where people uh, appear to have motives be- through dint of their ownership but and get influenced because of that, but actually have this ulterior motive. It, maybe it's not so common, but it does seem to me to be a, a totally unaddressed issue. But anyway, right, it's, one of those, to- it's one of those things where if I, you know, if I burnt down my own house to get the insurance money, it's clearly illegal. Right? <laughs> like, there, there's no question about that. Where you know you have these kind of capital structures that mimic the same gambling structure, and you know, well, what what do we do about that? But yeah, yeah. now sadly, so so uh, coming the the big thing about uh, the the house bill is that you had so so to regulate derivatives the, the way we want to approach it, uh, the way the administration want to approach it, and I, I think it's a good idea is to have a clearing house, so you have some sort of institution that stands between all the trades. Yep. And and then um, for what. For what derivatives that it's applicable for, uh, you put them on an exchange. So you want to get the price information out there. I don't think that this would have stopped Magnetar, but if one of the obvious fault lines in the Magnetar case is that people were buying insurance really cheap. Right. Right. They they were able to insure this bond that was clearly going to fail for incredibly small amount of money. Right. The price was totally wrong. Right. And I think perhaps, and you know, Hindsight's always twenty twenty. If there was better price transparency with with both the CDOs and the CDS, CDOs is a whole other problem that's not really at all well negotiated in this bill. Um, but if the CDS had a bit better uh, post trade uh, price transparency, we would have been in a better place. Now, let me ask you about the difference between exchanges and clearing houses. Uh, I got it. For, I got the impression from your uh, your post today um, that. You think that clearinghouses are inadequate, and I've sort of had a hunch that they're inadequate too. Do you? Do you, is that right? Inadequate for what? So that, that, that's the question. So the clearinghouse will help take care of the counterparty risk. So 
what what happens is that if I have a trade with you and you have trouble, I I, I don't know who else you have exposures to. And, and more, so so you had two things that were ongoing. One is that you have a spider web of exposures, and then when a crisis hits, no one knows who has what, and and no one has yeah. any incentive to trust any other person. And anyone who wants to trade is probably insolvent. There's these game theory things where, you know, right. if, if I'm like, hey, buy this, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, right. that, that, may, that means I'm the sucker. You know, that, it, it's like a lemon problem. It's like that old lemon problem where, like, if I want to sell you my car, clearly something's wrong with it. <laughs> right, right. Um, uh, or the so, Groucho Marx problem. Right, right, yeah. right. So, so the clearinghouse helps club. takes care of that. And, and there's, there's worries that we're concentrating risk in the clearinghouse. Um, Perhaps, but at least we're in this with our eyes wide open. There, there's ways to really try to regulate it as a public utility. Will it be enough? I hope so. Um, but I, I don't think it will perform any worse. I mean, um, the the problem that I have with the clearinghouse is twofold. One is is that it seems like you're creating another too big to fail institution because you know a clearinghouse has got to be uh, it's going to be either undercapitalized or overcapitalized because it's impossible to be perfectly capitalized and the incentives will all be to undercapitalize it. And then the other problem is that it really seems to me if it's dominated by the five big derivatives houses, then uh, then it just becomes a tool of those houses and an instrument for consolidating market power in those institutions. Um, and I know some of the smaller players are concerned about that. You know, I, I could not agree more with that. Uh, and that, that's a problem for exchanges as well, is that, you know, um, one is that you're, you're going to ask the clearinghouse to implement these rules. And, you know, the five major dealer banks are, will, will de- are the people who determine those rules, right? So it's, you know, the, the, the fox right. are in charge of the, the hen house, so to speak. And, you know, they can drag their feet. They can obviously just do things that are optimal for them. And as, you know, we kind of see here is that there's no reason whatsoever to really believe that they're going to have the market's best interest at heart, much less like individual client or, you know, you know, their, their clients, much less the greater markets. Um, so there is worries there. There is something in the house bill that uh, the Lynch amendment, which limited ownership, um, but it was grandfathered. So it wouldn't have done anything for the current, current clearinghouses. So, I mean, uh-huh. it's a problem. So, so I, I'm at the point where, you know, you need to break up the biggest banks and we can talk about that in a few minutes, but, um, you know, yeah. in, in order to really systemically change the way the market works right now is that th- there needs to be a size cap on, on the uh, somewhere around 3% of GDP on liabilities, which is what we're worried about. Um, so so the derivatives in the house, well, the other thing was that uh, the, what what constitutes an exchange was so watered down that basically two people on a phone could be an exchange, like me and you right now could call ourselves an exchange if we had huh. a, Right kind of database hooked up to it. Um, That's so, a business idea, man. We should uh, shop yeah. this uh, journalism thing, blogging thing, and uh, <laughs> get into it. You know. So, um, so that was in the hospital. So, um, Senator Lincoln is facing a, a fairly strong primary challenge, which should maybe tell people some things about how politics should work. But um, she's facing a fairly strong uh, primary challenge. She's known as a fairly conservative Democrat. So. Um, she proposed a really strong derivatives bill. Um, You know, it's not, I don't want to overstate it because it's not perfect, but in terms of what we're expecting from the Senate and specifically what we're expecting from the Ag Committee, it's really good. Um, There's the the uh, foreign exchange swaps uh, are are no longer outside the umbrella, which they were for quite some time, which which upset quite a bit of people. And in general, the language is where we want it. It's not, there there are little things that can change. but it's not worth fighting. The, it's not worth talking about it right here. I mean, people can send me emails or whatnot. But in general, we were very surprised with how strong that is. Now, I actually did not write about it very much because I was a little worried. Um, I'm going to say off the record because this is being recorded live. But I was a little yeah, worried. Gonna kind of about, I was kind of worried. About, don't worry about it for ProPublica. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little worried that it was a bit of a stalking horse and that it was clearly going to get dropped a little bit later, but everyone was going to kind of be happy about it. But it passed out of Ag Committee with um, a Republican vote. So I'm actually really excited about this now. I really think that it could make it. Now, how- like Grassley came around who uh, is also mm-hmm. facing a, um, a re-election campaign. So I, I hope the Democrats are understanding that there is a lot of energy and anger out there on this issue. That you know, you, you kind of I talk about this with people. Where when 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 the financial reformers want to change something, where's the burden of proof? And and I find that the burden of proof is overwhelmingly on people who want to change the the financial sector. Like hmm. 
and you can kind of see it with the Democrats who are just seem like they're perpetually apologizing in some way for for wanting to regulate derivatives. And, you know, there's a hundred apologies for it, as if, you know, taxpayers didn't have to step up with the $200 billion, you know, line of credit to AIG to, to backstop the CDS market. Um, so, yeah, you know, I have uh, I've thought that the uh, Democratic Party has consistently underestimated the anger at Wall Street. Uh, I, I think that, um, you know, a lot of the Tea Party movement is a kind of inchoate anger uh, at the the Wall Street bailouts, which had been conflated with the stimulus plan and health care and uh, sort of all rolled into one. But the really the genesis of it, in in my view, was uh, uh, the Wall Street bailouts. And uh, the Democrats have been largely incompetent at capitalizing on this politically, maybe until now. Maybe they're sort of getting figuring this out, but uh, it has seemed to me to be uh, a bungle uh, of epic proportions. Yeah, um, one of our, our scholars here at the Roosevelt Institute, uh, uh, a, guy, a political economy guy named Thomas Ferguson, wrote a paper just recently, I'll just put, a, we'll put a link in the sidebar, that says um, there wasn't really good exit polling from the Scott Brown election, so he kind of went through uh, statistically and looked at places where mortgages are really underwater. And uh, uh-huh. honestly, and, and, so, and he, he got a pretty good empirical handle on the idea that you know, a lot of this rage is essentially coming from the foreclosure crisis, the mortgage crisis, and the Wall Street bailouts. Huh. That's so very we'll, interesting. We'll put a link up there to that. But, um, yeah, it's it's and, and, and the foreclosure crisis stuff is, is obviously affecting a lot of people. And it, it's even if you're not directly impacted, it, it's around you and it affects your price of your home and what, what options you have with moving. But, um, yeah, sure. Yeah, Going forward, um, you know, I kind of look at six things in play in the Senate, and I and I wrote a kind of updated paper, and hopefully uh, we can get um, a, a link for that as well. Yeah, that so, was great today. Yeah, I really appreciate it. So, thank you. Yeah, it, it, it's moving so fast, and so many things like are changing day by day. It's good to kind of step back and say, well, what do we want this to do? And one thing to, to work from things that I think are are I'm going to do the reverse order of what I think is the most important. But um, I'll put things that, to me, are very straightforward, and I don't understand why people disagree. But one is to reform off balance sheets. Um, there's some pretty good language, actually some fairly really good language from Senator Menendez's office that um, kind of says, okay, we need to reform. Fast fees, you know, we'll get to it eventually, but we need to kind of step in with, with better off balance sheet stuff and fiduciary responsibilities. I do Wait, think are you going from least important to most important here? Um I, I, I'm going from 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 most likely to happen, I, or things oh. that, that I think. It, it's hard for me to, to to think that people without a vested interest would think that fiduciary is not a a good, at least a, a starting point. So it's going to end with with breaking up the bank. So we'll, we'll get back uh, to that. Okay, okay, because because uh, I was going to say that I thought you know Frank Partnoy gave a great talk on off balance sheet uh, issues uh, at your conference, the Roosevelt Conference, uh, and uh, and I thought it's gotten very little attention. Uh, so I'm surprised that you say that that's sort of the most obvious. I thought that that was kind of being neglected. Yeah, it probably is. I, I don't even know what's up anymore. Uh-huh. This stuff. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> All right, so move on to uh, off balance sheet. Yeah, second. Yeah, it's actually interesting. Bill Black gave some testimony sitting right next to Dick Fold, which is fantastic. But you know, the people to listen to it are, are people who are involved with the SNL crisis. Bill Black was very involved with it, and people yeah, sure. like kind of. I think there was the writing on the wall that if, if things didn't change, it was just going to get worse. And I think they kind of see the same crisis over and over again. But um. Yeah, so, so uh, watch for off-balance sheets. Um, watch for the Volcker rule being uh, actually put into law. There, there's stuff in the bill to kind of examine it, and maybe it'll be implemented, maybe it won't. But to actually put a, a, a – div- spinning out the prop trading part of a business is, is important for the, the actual market integrity, that you, you don't want people who are supposed to be intermediaries taking advantage of the fact – that they have information and they can profit off of it. Well, I mean, in the case of CDOs, CDO desks, which were arranging the CDOs for investors, were sitting sitting literally next to CDO prop desks that were arranging CDOs that were uh, short bets that the investment banks were making themselves. Uh, and so these are the, the this is the kind of trade that Goldman was uh, tagged by the uh, SEC for for fraud, uh, and and they were sitting literally. Uh, I don't actually know if Goldman Sachs were, but other banks like Barclays, they, those two desks, those and 
Deutsche Bank. They were literally sitting next to each other, communicating with each other every single day, and some cases uh, with the same P&L. So same profit, profit and loss statement uh, going up to the, their bosses. So that's obviously an enormous area of potential conflict of interest. And a guy just told me today those guys could be Mother Teresa, and uh, they would still have acted selfishly. You know, so uh, that is a crucial area. And, and I'm surprised about your optimism because I thought that that vocal rule seemed to be dead on arrival. Yeah, let's not do my story anymore. Let's now that, now that I right. have to think about it, I'm like, yeah, it all doesn't seem practical. But but you know, but, you try to be optimistic. It's uh, you uh, know, it's the end. It's the last. All right. Story. Well, I I, uh, I like uh, I <laughs> well, admire I optimism. But isn't the Blanche Lincoln derivatives proposal doesn't it have an element of uh, the Volcker rule to it uh, because she wants to separate um, commercial banks from anybody who deals in derivatives, right? Right. She she specifically doesn't want FDIC insurance and specifically the Fed discount window uh, backing shadow banks and prop trading desks. Um, I think that's actually a fairly um, part of part of the reason we need to do that is instead of liquidating certain firms that all be with the letter G, um, G Mac, G Capital, Goldman Sachs, we decided to turn them <laughs> into uh, we decided to turn them into bank holding companies. Something that normally takes years and requires lots of paperwork and is a huge hassle. They did it in the course of a weekend. Which, in general, um, is a problem because they suddenly have access to this form of social insurance in the discount window, and right. their business, the, the discount window is not a trivial toy. It's meant to make sure the payment system works. It's meant to make sure I can like get a check cashed if I have enough money for it. Um, the idea that it's being used as a hot money pump into a swap desk is actually really should concern us. And yeah, if it's, we, it's stunning. And if if we need a system, if that's if we need a system where we essentially need to backstop investment shadow banks, then we need to do that formally. We can't do it through a, a mechanism that's poorly designed for it. And um, uh, the other problem, what you have is the Fed discount window like disproportionately helps businesses that are, are you know, that are very funded through wholesale businesses instead of core deposits. There, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's it's a really bad system, and it really amplifies bad incentives. So the the Lincoln bill, thankfully, uh, pulls them out of there, and, th- and I think that's going to actually be a really good thing if it, if it makes it through. So the, I, the I just was if that if that makes it through, I think it would be it's amazing. Uh, amazing thing, and it sort of might sneak through given the political climate and given how fast the Democrats are moving on this. It's pretty amazing. So let and me actually, ask you... Oh, go ahead. Very, very last quickly, if it makes it through, it actually is a return to Glass-Steagall, because I know people kind of want to go back right. and talk about... Uh, like, McCain wants to repeal uh, Graham leach Bailey, but at that point, that was like a formality. Like, there was 30 years of deregulation to, to get us to that point. Um, and in terms of, like, functionally the way the market works is that that would be a return to something that is closer to Glass-Steagall. And I, I think that's a good move if we actually want to, to remove these conflicts of interest that the Magnetar piece really shows up. In. But Right, exactly. I mean, you know, uh, once you have those businesses split up, the in-house uh, hedge fund business at Goldman Sachs or the in-house private equity fund at Morgan Stanley become much less concerning. Uh, you know, there's still there's still businesses that maybe they shouldn't uh, necessarily have and should be examined uh, uh, that way. But it's uh, they're going to be much less levered businesses. They're going to be much more transparent, uh, or at least easier to get a handle on. Uh, uh, you know, so that uh, that would go a long way toward uh, toward the Volcker the Volcker proposal. So I thought that was very interesting proposal, and and it might sneak in there. Yeah, I, I am. I am certainly rooting for it. And then, and then the last thing we're watching is um, a holding the line on the the Lincoln bill, and then a holding the line on prefunding, which I think is very important. But um, uh-huh. we we can talk about that. And then the last thing is the, the Safe Bank Act, which would impose a three percent uh, cap on liabilities according to U.S. GDP, and yeah. uh, also a hard cap on fifteen to one leverage. Um, you know, leverage is, is a tough thing to measure, and it, it involves uh, liquidity, which is obviously the big problem. But the, the administration has made it very clear that they're going to kick it to Basel three to figure out how to handle that. Um, oh, and I, I, Basel two only <laughs> took uh, 15 years or so, so uh, we'll have a s- solution to uh, the leverage in 2025. It'll be great. 
if our if our audience's instinct is to say, well, Basil two failed, what we clearly needed was Basil three. Yeah. <laughs> if you feel yes. if you feel a bit of sickness, trust me, if you know Basil well, it's, you'll feel sicker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, that does sound terrifying. Um, I do like the uh, what it does seem the the hard caps on leverage seem uh, to be like uh, seem to be a good idea uh, from the people I've talked to and. And uh, it gives regulators, sort of ties regulators' hands, which we've, we've heard a lot about this, you know, dumb regulation versus smart regulation, or Krugman talks about Roman le- regis- legislation, you know, blunt instruments versus Greek legislation, nimble, smart uh, legislation. And I'm interested to hear where you come down on it, but it seems like if you sort of give regulators hard and fast rules, then it limits their ability to be captured by the industries they regulate. It's crucial. Um, Rich Carnell, who was uh, who wrote a lot of the banking laws in the '90s, um, you know, he was a contributor to the Make Markets Be Markets thing, and he wrote a thing about regulators' incentives. And you know, the 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 problem is is that every incentive is bad for you to to both go against a cycle and also to actually close down a bank or a financial institution. You know, yeah. congressmen are calling you saying, why are you shutting down this bank? If you have a hard rule, you can tell the congressman, well, my hands were tied; I had to do this. And it's 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 people make it seem like we're, we're beating on the, the regulators, but in some sense it actually frees them to actually do their job because it gives them a lot of cover. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so so I, I do I do like especially when hard rules like kind of fence in regulators. So you know, fifteen to one hard leverage. Now if you want to make that harder, if you want to really target um, you know liquidity, if you want to target other things, that's great. But we as ta- as citizens we demand some level of protection under which you know over which it can't inflict. Yeah, so. yeah. Now, I have a question. Let me ask you about this whole too-big-to-fail issue, because uh, people on the same side of the spectrum really disagree with this, and Paul Krugman has been making an argument that uh, too-big-to-fail, arguing against too-big-to-fail is wrong-headed, and I, you know, I don't speak for him, obviously, but the way I m- interpret his views are for two reasons. One is that... Uh, Size is not necessarily the problem. Look at Canada. Canada, the collection of big banks, and they had relatively few problems. And even if we have lots and lots of small institutions, if they're all failing at once, as they did in the Great Depression, we're going to bail them out anyway. So we're going to be bailing people out. So what we need is uh, better ways to seize banks and much stronger legislation. Uh, sorry, regulation. And, but you, you agree you want to break up the big banks. Right, so I, I I don't view it as an either or issue. So so, so a lot of people, and I, I think this is a, a, a unfortunate byproduct of the kind of Democrats versus Republicans phrasing it this way, is that you can either kind of do so. The bill, what it does for people who are, uh, don't know it, is basically it, it gives a larger regulatory umbrella. So so non banks that are large and systemically risky will have prudential regulations. They have to be regulated like a commercial bank, um, and that there is a mechanism for winding them down. Or, you know, taking them over over the course of a weekend, running them through a company, selling off parts, writing down creditors. Um, I think, so the first thing to, to note is that if Lehman was to go down and we had a perfect, smooth resolution, um, it would still have been a disaster for the economy. I mean, there's no, like, we, we have an idea of, like, FDIC that, you know, you can, uh, the, the community bank goes under in a weekend and no one feels anything. But if you have a, something with $800, you know, billion dollars in it, 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 it going from a solvent firm to an insolvent firm over the course of the weekend, the economy is going to feel that. Right. So, so I, 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 I think it's important to not overemphasize what resolution can do, even if it's perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Now, this is what, this is what I say to people is that you know we're going to put a lot of stress on an untested idea that we can resolve companies with a hundred, you know, working in a hundred com- countries, thirty countries, with possibly you know very difficult legal charters that are purposely being used against us. Right. Um, you know, the, the, there's a lot of problems with the resolution mechanism, but what it essentially needs to do is it needs to detect problems ahead of time and set up a means for winding them down, and that is just significantly easier to do with a smaller firm. That, yeah. To make resolution credible and to make sure that it will actually do the job we want it to, it needs to. It works so much better with smaller firms and firms that have a siloing of risk. So, you know, a smaller firm that also, you know, ha- does not run a prop desk if it's taking payments, uh, et cetera, it is much easier for regulators to both monitor them, you know, credibly say, we will resolve you if you don't do this, and then if they're about to go and solve them, resolve them. 
So, so to me, it's, it's not even an either or, but it, it actually, a smaller bank makes it credible that we can actually do resolutions. So that, that's my kind of big take on that. So um, do you think it's at all uh, remotely realistic that we might get something that limits the size of the big banks uh, in this round of uh, regulatory reform? You know, I, I, I don't know. Um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, it's, it's um, to, to me, this it, the, the important thing for this is this is not a 2010 battle. And this might be a good good idea for me to kind of close on is that to me this is not about 2010. It's not about getting you know something signed in the next six weeks before you know summer recess. It's 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 about I don't want to say it's generational because I hope it's not that long, but it's yeah. part of a longer battle to actually kind of make Wall Street less prone to these conflicts of interest that your article excellently displayed and and more more serving the actual people who are paying them, you know, to, to in finding ways of actually investing money that's productive to building a 21st century. Yeah. Well, that's a great note to, uh, to end on. So uh, why don't we end it there? Thanks a lot for uh, spending the time with me. It was really helpful. I learned a lot. Same back. Take care. Okay. Bye.